let's let's turn to uh, page 527 in your anthology, where you find a famous poem by Wilfred Owen called Dulce et Decorum Est. And uh, your footnote explains that that phrase is the beginning of a line from Horace, completed at the end of the poem, uh, that is in the last lines of the poem, pro patria mori, uh, translated as uh, it is sweet and, and proper, sweet and right, decorous, to die for one's country. Bent double like old beggars under sacks, knock-kneed, coughing like hags, we cursed from sludge till on the haunting flares we turned our backs and towards our distant rest began to trudge. Men marched asleep. Many had lost their boots but limped on, bloodshod. All went lame, all blind, drunk with fatigue, death even to the hoots of tired, outstripped five nines that dropped behind. Gas, gas, quick boys, an ecstasy of fumbling, fitting the clumsy helmets just in time, but someone still was yell <coughs> yelling out and stumbling and floundering like a man in fire or lime, dim through the misty panes and thick green light as under a green sea I saw him drowning. In all my dreams, before my helpless sight, he plunges at me, guttering, choking, drowning. If in some smothering dreams you too could pace behind the wagon that we flung him in and watch the white eyes writhing in his face, his hanging face like a devil's sick of sin, if you could hear at every jolt the blood come gargling from the froth-corrupted lungs, obscene as cancer, bitter as the cud of vile, incurable sores on innocent tongues, my friend, you would not tell with such high zest to children ardent for some desperate glory the old lie, dulce et decorum est, pro patria mori. Paul Fussell, uh, a, a literary critic, who wrote a, a brilliant book about uh, the literature and uh, uh, culture uh, of, of the First World War <coughs> uh, speaks of irony as, as the uh, essential trope or rhetorical figure uh, of this body of literature, World War I poetry. Uh, here is, in this poem, uh, an uh, uh, example of irony of a really comparatively simple kind. Uh, what are schoolboy school lines from Horace, lines that uh, Owen and many others would have learned in school uh, to recite, uh, uh, to have memorized? That uh, uh, poetry is here held up as propaganda, uh, as, as, uh, as a kind of murderous lie. It is sweet and, and right to die for one's country. Uh, uh, you, you, you can uh, feel it in the marvelous texture of this poetry uh, against Horace's decorous and elegant Latin. Uh, there is placed Owen's Anglo-Saxon alliterative, uh, inflected, strongly stressed uh, language uh, with its uh, rough uh, and uh, actual uh, vernacular diction. Uh, the power and authority to 
of, of uh, uh, Owen's writing uh, is, well, certified, we feel, uh, by that first person uh, that speaks to us, that, that I who speaks from, as a, uh, as a witness uh, to uh, war, uh, as a describer, uh, as someone telling a reader elsewhere uh, what he has seen and speaking specifically for uh, one fallen soldier. <coughs> uh, the reception of Owen's poetry has always been uh, attached to um, uh, a sense of Owen as uh, a soldier and witness to war, uh, and indeed as a victim of war, uh, who uh, uh, died uh, a week before the armistice. Uh, this, uh, these poems uh, that you see the uh, cover for here, um, <coughs> excuse me, poems by Wilfred Owen. Uh, originally appeared posthumously uh, uh, after uh, uh, Owen's death, uh, introduced by Siegfried Sassoon, uh, comrade, fellow poet, fellow soldier. Uh, and, and as you can see, uh, it, it, uh, in addition to the introduction, um, uh, the cover advertises also a portrait of the art, uh, not a portrait of the artist, a portrait of the author. Uh, and there is Owen, uh, in uniform, uh, a handsome young man. Um, this is uh, all, as I say, very much part of the um, transmission of Owen's poetry. Uh, Dulce et decorum est uh, is, a, is a great poem, uh, but the kind of irony that it puts forward is, uh, I think, a simple one. Uh, it is. Uh, well, and, and it's a poem, uh, there are lots of them uh, that are, are great poems uh, that when I first started teaching this course, I decided I wouldn't teach. Uh, and, and for a number of reasons, uh, including, um, well, uh, the sense that, uh, gee, Yeats, Stevens, uh, uh, Eliot, these are hard poets and we need as much time on them as we can uh, in order to read uh, their work, and, and uh, this poem uh, seems uh, like one you might uh, find and uh, be able to read yourself uh, without me there to explain it. Um, <coughs> it also is the case that probably, probably many of you have already read it uh, and possibly studied it in school and talked about it. So at any rate, this seems to me to be, uh, when I started teaching this course, um, uh, you know, uh, reasons not to teach it. Uh, besides, besides, uh, well, I think the first time I taught this course, <coughs> uh, the, uh, um, well, uh, was a few years after the Gulf War, uh, the first Gulf War, uh, and uh, it seemed uh, to me, uh, in, in my uh, historical innocence, that uh, uh, the irony <coughs> that uh, Owen is playing upon here, uh, that he's putting forward to us, uh, was, was not one that I would need to talk about uh, in a classroom. Uh, it seemed to me uh, as though uh, no one would ever quote Horace again as anything but a lie. Um, of course, uh, that's not the case. <coughs> Uh, you know, uh, as our, our present uh, war has gone on, uh, how many times have we uh, heard people uh, in many different forms uh, speaking uh, of justifications uh, for uh, the deaths of young men and women uh, on behalf of the nation? Well. Um, uh, you know, uh, as we watch our, our um, as we watch our president's uh, approval ratings for his conduct of the war drop, uh, one wonders: Well, <coughs> could any of us really be surprised by this? Uh, and well, uh, 
certainly Wilfred Owen would not have been. Uh, and it seemed to me as though, uh, in fact, uh, it was important to read Wilfred Owen and to uh, go on thinking and talking about his poetry. <coughs> and not only Owen, of course, but uh, really the extraordinary uh, rich body of British World War I poetry uh, as a whole, uh, writing that is uh, not by any means uh, all about battle, though much of it is, like that poem I just read. Uh, today, what I want to do is, is give you a, some sense of this uh, body of writing. Uh, and unlike uh, the last few lectures where I've concentrated on a single poet and, and tried to make arguments about uh, that poet and, and have uh, you know, a thesis, uh, today what I want to do is really just show you different poems uh, and different uh, poets, uh, a, you know, a range of, of uh, uh, brilliant uh, writing. <coughs> um, in addition to an opportunity to think about poetry and war, uh, it's also a good opportunity to, to start to fill out a little bit our sense of, of what modern poetry is or uh, was, um, uh, what it is or was, also what it did not become. Uh, World War I uh, destroyed uh, an English generation. Um, you know, uh, modern poetry, as we study it in this class, and uh, you know, I, I think uh, as as you see it in this this anthology, is an international phenomenon. It's not uh, um <coughs> well. Uh, we don't have a lot of English poets on this syllabus. Um, there's uh, T. S. Eliot, uh, the only great English poet born in America. Uh, there's uh, uh, W. H. Auden, <coughs> uh, an English-born poet who moved to America. Uh, most of the figures that we study are, in fact, Americans. Uh, there's, there's Yeats, too. Uh, all of them are, in a sense, internationals. Uh, and there, there's a, uh, you know, a, a range of, of important cultural reasons for this. But there's also the simple fact of, of the war. Uh, arguably, uh, the great modern English poets died uh, in, in uh, the teens in France in 1915 or 1917. Uh, or uh, they survived, uh, like Ivor <coughs> Gurney, who you have some samples from in a, in a wounded uh, and, and uh, um, uh, injured uh, state. Um, I also uh, think it's important for us to uh, think about the war uh, as, as um, uh, an important context uh, when we go on to read Pound and Eliot, uh, when we uh, encounter uh, in their poetry uh, a sense of uh, apocalyptic uh, change uh, of civilization in crisis, which can seem pretty vague sometimes. Uh, well, um, and this is true for the Yeats poems that we've been talking about as well. Uh, Yeats is obviously writing uh, in the context of an Irish civil war, but uh, it's also the case that he's writing in the uh, uh, shadow of the First World War as well. Uh, you know, uh, on July 1st, 1916, uh, more than uh, 57,000 English troops uh, were uh, wounded or, or dead. Uh, uh, I think uh, almost 20,000 on that day um, died. And uh, in, the, in the Battle of the Somme, um, as it unfolded, uh, there were a million casualties. Uh, this is, this is a, you know, a scale of, of uh, uh, human suffering uh, and, and uh, uh, um, a kind of, um, well, a, a scale of human suffering that is enormous and hard to comprehend and leaves its shadow across uh, the writing that we will be reading. Uh, I, uh, all the poets we will be uh, talking about today are, are men, 
uh, not quite all soldiers, but most of them. Uh, I've given you some quotes um, uh, from Virginia Woolf, uh, <coughs> partly to uh, remind us that uh, the war did not only exist for men uh, or soldiers, uh, and that it existed uh, in England uh, as quite as uh, uh, much uh, as it uh, existed on the continent. Uh, well, uh, w with all that uh, said by preparation, uh, let me uh, show you some more poems. Um, beginning with Thomas Hardy on page 51. <coughs> Hardy is, um, uh, this is, this is uh, a little pamphlet uh, of uh, war poems Hardy published uh, in uh, 1917 and that, that uh, uh, you can find in the Beinecke. Uh, Hardy, arguably the, the greatest English poet, um, modern English poet, uh, is, is a figure we don't um, study in this course otherwise. Uh, he is uh, a poet from another century. He's born, uh, in fact, 20 years before the American Civil War, uh, <coughs> when World War I began. Uh, he was 74. Uh, he wrote uh, his poems from the perspective of uh, uh, the rural England that was the setting for almost all of his novels, almost all of his poetry, uh, and channel firing on the bottom of 51. Uh, is um, uh, also set in uh, the west of England, uh, Hardy's home country, uh, and uh, is, is set right on the, the verge of the First World War. It's a poem about gunnery practice. Uh, yeah, uh, it's, uh, it's uh, a dramatic monologue spoken by one of the dead in a graveyard. <coughs> That night your great guns unawares shook all our coffins as we lay and broke the chancel window squares. We thought it was the judgment day and sat upright. Hardy, Hardy, Hardy has, has, has various gothic and supernatural fancies that he uh, asks us to imagine in vivid homely terms. While drearysome arose the howl of wakened hounds, it, it, this is all this, this wonderful observed detail of rural life. The mouse let fall the altar crumb, the worms drew back into the mounds, the glebe cow drooled, till God called, No, it's gunnery practice out at sea, just as before you went below. The world is as it used to be. This is not the second coming. All <laughs> kind of reply to Yeats, although Yeats hasn't written his poem yet. All nations striving strong to make red war yet redder, mad as hatters, they do no more for Christie's sake than you, who are helpless in such matters. That this is not the judgment hour for some of them is a blessed thing. For if it were, they'd have to scour hell's floor for so much threatening. Ha, ha. It's Hardy's God laughs like that. <coughs> it will be warm. <laughs> Frost would have understood it. Uh, it will be warmer when I blow the trumpet, if indeed I ever do, for you are men and rest eternal sorely need. This, this is God so cruel that he will not deliver the second coming. The, Day of Judgment. So down we lay again. I wonder, will the world ever saner be, said one, than when he sent us under in our indifferent century? And many a skeleton shook his head. Instead of preaching forty year, my neighbor Parson Thirdly said, I wish I had stuck to pipes and beer. Again the guns disturbed the hour roaring their readiness to avenge as far inland as Storton Tower and Camelot and Starlet Stonehenge. 
gunnery practice uh, disturbs the dead, uh, disrupts the ground. Uh, you know, here, here war refuses to let the dead lie in peace uh, with the notion that not even the dead are, are safe from it, unaffected by it. Uh, the church windows shatter. Well, in some sense, this is exactly what, what modernity might be seen to be doing to traditional English culture. Uh, Hardy is, is full of all those quaint Gothic, uh, archaic uh, dictions uh, and, and fancies. Uh, the dead are raising their objections here to, to guns uh, uh, that will be uh, used very shortly uh, in the Great War. Uh, God reassures them, though, of course, what he says here is, is not reassuring. Uh, he says that although Red War is getting redder, it's really as it always has been. Uh, this is not the end of the world that it appears to be. Uh, he's not about to let man mankind off the hook with Judgment Day. Uh, the speaker narrator lies back uh, and wonders uh, if the world will ever be saner. Uh, his neighbor, uh, uh, says, well, I don't think so. I wish I had, uh, uh, you know, pleasured myself and uh, uh, rather than uh, serving that uh, wicked God. Uh, in the last stanza, then, there is that extraordinary shift uh, of perspective. Uh, the sound of the guns carries inland. Uh, into the heart of England, uh, and as it does, it carries back also in time to Camelot and to Starlet Stonehenge. Uh, what happens when that happens? Uh, what is the meaning of, of this, the power of, this, of the sound of the guns to, to uh, echo back in time? Uh, as Hardy evokes Camelot and Stonehenge, you, you might, you might uh, read this, understand this as, um, as, as what? As dignifying and legitimating the present, uh, uh, present firing, the present conflict? Uh, or, in some sense, does it go just the opposite? Does it, uh, does it suggest that England's History and its heritage and its honor uh, are in jeopardy. Uh, uh, does it, in some sense, demythologize the past, demystify it, make us see Camelot and Stonehenge as part of uh, a bar barbaric uh, uh, history, um, uh, such as? is about to unfold in 1914. Uh, there are a, a couple other uh, Hardy poems uh, in your anthology, uh, memorable and powerful, uh, that are war poems, uh, including uh, on page 59, In the Time of the Breaking of Nations. And then on the next page, uh, I looked up from my writing, interesting to look at these together. Uh, in, in this first poem, uh, Hardy affirms the endurance of rural life and its, its cycles. Only a man harrowing clods in a slow, silent walk with an old horse that stumbles and nods, half asleep as they stalk. Only thin smoke without flame from the heaps of couch grass. Yet this will go onward the same, though dynasties pass. Yonder a maid in her white come whispering by, War's annals will fade into night ere their story die. Uh, rural life, including uh, um, rituals of love and courtship, uh, here are represented as 
poetry's truest subject and as a kind of enduring uh, uh, source of, of um, uh, social life and meaning. Uh, you could compare this poem to uh, the poem placed last in, in Yeats's uh, uh, last poems called Politics uh, that might seem to say something similar. Uh, in Hardy here and in other poems, there's uh, this wonderfully self-consciously archaic language. Uh, Hardy wants to use really old uh, dialect uh, words <coughs> when he can, uh, and, and there's, there's, a, there's, there's power in that. And this is a poem composed in 1915. Uh, when we read the love song of J. Alfred Prufrock, when we read Pound's first canto, uh, remember that those poems are written, published at just the same time this poem is being written. Uh, poems with uh, very different um, uh, ways of, of proceeding uh, in different kinds of language. Uh, in the second poem here, I looked up from my writing, uh, the poet, the first person, is being interrupted uh, at his desk uh, at night. Uh, he's, he uh, is startled uh, to see the moon's full gaze on me. Uh, her meditative misty head was spectral in its air, and I involuntarily said, what are you doing there? And, and Hardy, Hardy works in these uh, song forms that, well, they sound like popular ballads, uh, and, and he, he, he wants you to uh, uh, you know, hear them as part of almost a kind of folk literature, <coughs> which he draws on. Uh, the the uh, moon says to him, Oh, I've been scanning pond and hole and waterway hereabout for the body of one with a sunken soul who has put his life light out. Did you hear his frenzied tattle? It was sorrow for his son who is slain in brutish battle, though he has injured none. And now the moon says, I am curious to look into the blinkered mind, poet, of one who wants to write a book in a world of such a kind. Her temper, the poet then says, overwrought me, and I edged to, sh to shun her view to get out of the moonlight, for I felt assured she thought me one who should drown him too. Uh, here, uh, a neighbor father, uh, crazed with grief at the death of his son, uh, has drowned himself, uh, uh, killed himself, uh, and the moon uh, implies uh, in its uh, gaze that the poet should do so too. Uh, in such a world, uh, it seems writing poems is, is a, a kind of, well, e even surviving uh, is a kind of guilty privilege. You could compare with this poem. Uh, Kipling's uh, uh, poem, uh, Kipling, one of the great apologists of empire, uh, saying on page 153 of, of your, your book, uh, in the voice of a soldier, uh, if any question why we, we soldiers, died, tell them our fathers lied. Uh, a statement that is uh, uh, poignant, uh, uh, poignant and powerful in part because Kipling's own son, died in the war. This is a, a volume of poems published in 1917 by Edward Thomas and a portrait of Thomas, another soldier poet, uh, not represented, however, as a soldier here, uh, represented uh, rather as a uh, uh, English citizen in Tweed, uh, a man uh, out in and of nature. Thomas was born in 1878, so he was 36 uh, when the war began. Uh, he began almost at the same time as the war began to write poems. Uh, he begins writing. Uh, under the influence of his friend, Robert Frost. Uh, Frost and Thomas have a fascinating relationship. 
an important uh, transatlantic exchange. Uh, Frost's famous poem, The Road Less Traveled By, uh, he uh, sometimes described as being about Thomas and Thomas' own sense of regret and hesitation and indirection uh, to which Frost contrasted himself. Uh, Frost became, in England, uh, uh, a poet of New England whom Thomas was reading at that moment in such a way as to help enable him, Thomas, to become a great poet of England <laughs> uh, and of England's uh, uh, landscape and, and countryside uh, and uh, nature. Uh, there are, uh, th there's a good selection from Thomas uh, in your anthology. Uh, I will uh, read my f favorite poem by Thomas, uh, which is the first one called Adelstrop on 231. Uh, <coughs> Yes, I remember Adelstrop, the name, because one afternoon of heat the express train drew up there unwantedly. It was late June. The steam hissed. Someone cleared his throat. No one left and no one came on the bare platform. What I saw was Adelstrop, only the name and willows, willow herb and grass and meadow sweet and haycocks dry, no whit less still and lonely fair than the high cloudlets in the sky. And for that minute a blackbird sang close by and round him mistier, farther and farther, all the birds of Oxfordshire and Gloucestershire." It's a wonderful poem in its uh, simplicity, modesty, uh, directness, and reticence, which yet provides the most uh, expansive and exhilarating uh, sense of the English landscape and of the power of a moment in time to uh, uh, enlarge and, and uh, be um, pregnant with meaning. Uh, notice, uh, notice Thomas's really superb nonchalance uh, and offhandedness and simplicity. It was late June. The steam hissed. I mean, there, there's a kind of uh, colloquial clarity and confidence, uh, quite different from the uh, vernacular language in um, uh, the Hardy poems I was just reading, which are also poems of the countryside. Uh, here, the name, the name, the odd name, Adelstrop, prompts a memory. Uh, prompts a memory in such a way that a moment in time stands out, separated from other moments, just as the odd, unpoetic, unbeautiful name Adelstrop seems to stand out. There, there's a kind of poignant tension between the unbeautifulness of the name, the awkwardness, and yet the dignity of the name, uh, and the sense of natural beauty that the poem will unfold. Here the stopping of the train is like the, the interruption by memory of normal consciousness that's the basis of the poem. Uh, there's a sense that in this memory the poet somehow saw the name. <laughs> uh, presumably, I suppose, saw it on a signboard uh, in, in the uh, station as you, you know, roll into a station and you see where you are. Uh, but there's, there's more suggestion uh, in it than that. Uh, 
it's as if this moment were one in which the name and the place, the word and the thing, uh, fully coincided. Uh, fully coincided in an experience of, of uh, 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 presence and, and immediacy, where the world is all there uh, and, and named, located, placed. Uh, the figure, the metaphor for this semiotic unity of, of word and thing uh, is birdsong. Uh, here, birdsong uh, is a kind of natural language, a language in which nature speaks, uh, and speaks in such a way uh, that the particular voice carries uh, the import and uh, authority of the general. Uh, uh, just as, as the one bird seems to sing with many bird songs by the end of the poem, and so Adelstrop itself suddenly seems to signify more, uh, calling to mind in a kind of rippling and radiating circles uh, uh, Oxfordshire, Gloucestershire, uh, England. All of it, the poet's home. Uh, at the same time, uh, it's also clear that this epiphany is a remembered experience. It's recalled. Uh, the poet's first word, yes, wonderful affirmation, uh, situates the poem in a dialogue, as if someone had just said, have you ever been to Adelstrop? Uh, whether this dialogue is, is you know, actual or inter internal, it doesn't really matter. Uh, the part of the poem's force derives from uh, uh, the uh, status of this moment as something remembered. Uh, and remembered um, uh, within the context of uh, a nation at war, although I believe uh, Thomas wrote the poem uh, the year he enlisted, but I think before his enlistment, uh, you might feel as though Thomas is already on the train uh, for France. Uh, there, there's a way in which the context of the war, too, shadows the poem uh, and, and remains present in it. Um, uh, don't you feel it uh, in certain uh, uh, details? Uh, the eerie lack of people in this place? No one left and no one came. Uh, in a sense, uh, it is an image of the English countryside at a moment in which it is being emptied out, uh, uh, its young men sent to France to die, uh, a kind of no man's land already. This is Siegfried Sassoon in uniform uh, in 1916. Uh, Sassoon's poetry uh, centers on uh, hallucinatory overlays of home front and battle front. Uh, let's look at blighters on, on page 389. Uh, a uh, wonderfully angry poem. Uh, a poem that, that is situated in a music hall, I guess presumably a London music hall. The house is crammed. Tear beyond tear they grin and cackle at the show, while prancing ranks of harlots shrill the chorus, drunk with din. We're sure the Kaiser loves the dear old tanks. I'd like to see a tank come down the stalls, lurching to ragtime tunes or home sweet home, and there'd be no more jokes in music halls to mock the riddle corpses round Beau Pum. Here there's an analogy between the music hall and the theater of war. Uh, it's as if the English populace were spectators only, uh, consuming as entertainment war propaganda, which makes the poet hate them. 
uh, he imagines here the eruption of the real uh, into this representational space uh, and, and imagines it as a kind of attack on the uh, uh, working and middle class audiences of the, of the music hall. Uh, the, the, uh, the soldier becomes, uh, in fantasy here, uh, the spectator as the war turns around and comes back, uh, uh, reversed by a kind of evil charm or spell uh, coming home. Uh, and home is here made to rhyme with Bopum, uh, bringing Battlefront and Homefront together as a rhyme. Uh, there, there's an aggression towards the urban crowd here that, that uh, recalls and exaggerates uh, Yeats's attitude at the same time, uh, uh, really in the same uh, years, uh, in poems like uh, A Coat or The Fisherman. In other Sassoon poems, the, the war comes home in, in other ways. Uh, for example, uh, well, uh, in uh, the rear guard, uh, just, just down the page here, uh, or repression of war experience, which is about uh, traumatic repetition of uh, uh, battle, uh, or in dreamers, uh, where um, there is, uh, uh, again, a kind of uh, juxtaposing of uh, life in the trenches and life in the city. <coughs> uh, rather than dwell longer on them, though, and to make sure I get time for a couple more poems, I want to move on and uh, consider – this is uh, Sassoon's poem, uh, poem's uh, counterattack, and this is the poetry of Isaac Rosenberg. Uh, here's a, a frontispiece with, with Rosenberg <laughs> in uh, a uh, uh, military coat. Uh, Rosenberg, was all, uh, besides a poet, was also an artist uh, and uh, uh, created these self-portraits. Self-portrait in France, 1915. Uh, Rosenberg, uh, in contrast to Sassoon, was poor, uh, Jewish, uh, and writes a rather different kind of poem from those we have been looking at today. Uh, one of the most famous uh, and extraordinary is Louse Hunting on page 506. A little bit further on in your book. Uh, nudes, stark and glistening, yelling in lurid glee. Grinning faces and raging limbs whirl over the floor one fire. For a shirt, verminously busy, yon soldier tore from his throat with oaths Godhead might shrink at, but not the lice. And soon the shirt was a flare over the candle he'd lit while we lay. Then we all sprang up and stripped to hunt the verminous brood. Here the, the soldiers are uh, stripping their clothes off and, and, and attacking the lice that are attacking them. Soon, like a demon's pantomime, the place was raging. It's, it's nighttime and, and, and the uh, candles and flares are throwing shadows. See the silhouettes agape. See the gibbering shadows mixed with the battled arms on the wall. See gargantuan hooked fingers pluck in supreme flesh to smutch supreme littleness. See the merry limbs in hot highland fling because some wizard vermin charmed from the quiet this revel when our ears were half lulled by the dark music blown from sleep's trumpet. A strange place for this poem to end. Uh, nudes, the poem begins. Uh, 
it, it, it's a uh, uh, shocking uh, and, and, and comic and pleasurable uh, to see the armored men, uniformed men, suddenly exposed, just naked bodies. To see them uh, here bedeviled not by a gas attack or machine guns, but lice, fleas. Uh, Rosenberg is writing, not in those little crafted stanzas of um, Hardy or of, um, for that matter, of Thomas. Uh, he's writing in a kind of strongly stressed uh, free verse with uh, variable line lengths, uh, lots of, um, uh, well, there, there, there's a sense in which the poetry itself is exuberant and naked and full of life and uh, Vi uh, vital uh, and, and naturalistic, you could say, in its um, representation. Uh, Rosenberg is giving us an anecdote from the trenches, and yet it slips very quickly into a, a sense of fable. Uh, uh, the, the louse hunting, where these big men hunt these little things, these fleas, uh, it becomes, uh, when it's thrown by shadow as a kind of flickering image on the tent or, or trench wall, uh, uh, when it becomes represented, so to speak, uh, it, it becomes a battle scene where gigantic forces smutch supreme littleness. Uh, we are put in mind of how men are to the gods as flies to men. Uh, this is an analogy as old as and found in Homer. <coughs> Uh, we are also put in mind of how the war is, in fact, anything but a revel, uh, though it, too, may have been provoked by a cause as insignificant and hard to trace as some wizard vermin. Uh, those last lines, then, are so ominous and strange. Uh, though these men have been brought to life uh, from sleep, uh, there's a sense that the trumpet will sound for them again, uh, and they will enter a dark sleep from which they won't wake, uh, which is just the, the point of uh, the next poem, uh, Returning, We Hear the Larks. I won't take time to read it, though, uh, or, or talk about it, uh, but instead uh, I'd like to conclude, this is a, another uh, great poet of the war who survived, though, um, uh, in, as I say, a, uh, a wounded uh, uh, condition mentally, Ivor Gurney. Uh, I want to conclude with uh, uh, a poem by Owen. Um, there's, uh, let's see, this is, this is page um, 528, uh, just following Dolce at decorum asked, uh, strange meeting. Uh, this is a, a, a poem that, uh, well, uh, if the first poem demystifies uh, uh, one crucial thread of war ideology, uh, that it is uh, right and good to die for the country, uh, this poem takes on uh, another uh, crucial uh, element of war ideology, that uh, the enemy is another. The enemy is unlike me. Uh, like Rosenberg, uh, like uh, Rosenberg's poem, uh, this one uh, comes out of and, and, and returns eventually to, to sleep. Uh, it is uh, a kind of dream vision, uh, Dantesque in, in its uh, uh, mode. Uh, and, and, and full of, um, here, um, powerful uh, iambic pentameter. It seemed that out of battle I escaped down some profound, dull tunnel, long since scooped through granites which titanic wars had groined. Yet also there encumbered sleepers groaned too fast in thought or death to be bestirred. 
Then, as I probed them, one sprang up and stared with piteous recognition in fixed eyes, lifting distressful hands as if to bless. And by his smile, I knew that sullen hall. By his dead smile, I knew we stood in hell. With a thousand pains, that vision's face was grained, yet no blood reached there from the upper ground, and no guns thumped or down the flues made moan. Strange friend, I said, here is no cause to mourn. None, said the other, save the undone years, the hopelessness. Whatever hope is yours was my life also. I went hunting wild after the wildest beauty in the world, which lies not calm in eyes or braided hair, but mocks the steady running of the hour, and if it grieves, grieves richlier than here. For by my glee might many men have laughed, and of my weeping something had been left, which must die now. I mean the truth untold, the pity of war, the pity war distilled. Now men will go content with what we spoiled, or discontent boil bloody and be spilled. They will be swift with swiftness of the tigress. None will break ranks, though nations trek from progress. Courage was mine, and I had mystery. Wisdom was mine, and I had mastery. To miss the march of this retreating world into vain citadels that are not walled. Then, when much blood had clogged their chariot wheels, I would go up and wash them from sweet wells even with truths that lie too deep for taint. I would have poured my spirit without stint, but not through wounds, not on the cess of war. Foreheads of men have bled where no wounds were. I am the enemy you killed, my friend. I knew you in this dark, for so you frowned yesterday through me as you jabbed and killed. I parried, but my hands were loathed and cold. Let us sleep now. So we'll stop now and move on to poems written during the same period and associated with imagism on Monday.